Okay, hold on one second. It's not letting us go live. It says it's live okay. my end. Does it? Oh, okay. Hi, everyone. Oh, <laughs> hello, everybody. Okay, well, we had a little technical snafu there. Sorry about <laughs> that. Uh, it's It was given trying to argue with me. So welcome to this month's episode of the Ally Member Q&A or Self-Publishing Inspirations Member Q&A podcast, where we answer your most burning self-publishing questions, anything, everything in between, seven stages of publishing. And here we are in a new year. I'm Michael Laran with my co-host, Sasha Black. How are hello, you, Sasha? Hello. I'm okay. I'm, I'm on the mend. I've had the Christmas lurgy, but I'm on the mend now. How are you? I am fine. I think I'm about to get the Christmas lurgy. So, um, you know, between the two of us, uh, I, I think by this time next month, we'll, we should both be on the mend. And we, <laughs> will, okay. we will. We will. Yeah. And I, I can imagine many of our listeners can relate uh, to all the bugs and things that are going around uh, uh, yeah. the winter season, the flu and COVID and RSV. And it's, know, everyone, uh, it's definitely an interesting time. Everyone's like, let's get together for Christmas. And then like in our heads, we're like, and spread all the germs. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we're, we're paying the price uh, yeah. uh, about uh, uh, Christmas and Thanksgiving. Uh, gathering, it was worth so. it. It was worth yeah, ab it. Abso absolutely worth it. Absolutely. And you know what else is worth it? The questions that we've got this month. Ooh. So we we are uh, making really good progress on our question log. So for you know people who are, are first time listening, if it happens to be a new year and you haven't uh, listened to the show, we answer all of our member questions. So if you're an Ally member, go into um, your Ally dashboard and, and um, we you can submit your questions and we will answer them on the show. And we're making really good progress and we have some really good questions this month, some really um, some questions we haven't gotten before. So I'm, I'm kind of excited to get into them. Uh, the first one is, uh, what do I do if another author has copied my cover? So the scenario here is you're on Amazon one day, you see a cover that looks suspiciously familiar. Up, oh, turns out somebody has completely copied your style. They maybe have copied elements from your cover and they're very clearly just copying the success that you have laid out with the cover that you've designed. What do you do? That's a tricky one, isn't it? Because there are, this, in a genre, there are expectations for a cover. Now, unless somebody in, well, this is my humble opinion, unless somebody has quite literally used an, the identical model, the identical type font in exactly the same pattern layout and color tones, then they've probably not copied your cover, even if it feels like they've copied your cover. Um, I think you would have to have a lot of those elements identical, not just similar. And this is the, this is the thing with a genre. You need your cover to look like the other covers in that genre. That is part of genre marketing. That is part and parcel, um, yeah, of being in a genre. Uh, when you walk into a bookstore as a reader, you can usually identify where your books are in that store by the tone and coloring of all of the books on the shelves. So like, you know, the young adult section because it's bright and bold colors and primary colors and, you know, there's cartoons or whatever. You know, when you're in the crime section because it's a lot darker, there's a lot of black covers, there's a lot of silhouettes on the front, um, you know, clean fonts. We go to the fantasy section and it's, it's a myriad of different types of things, but all the fonts are usually much swirlier. Maybe they're, uh, yeah, you know, so this is the problem. Um, and I think you would be hard pressed to do any kind of legal action on a cover unless it truly, truly was a like for like and they had literally ripped off your cover. But I don't know where you stand on that. Yeah, no, I, I think what you said is is right. It's, it's difficult to take legal action. I, I think we can draw a very clear line between copyright infringement of mm. a cover and plagiarism. Mm. So... You know, every once in a while, you know, I, I, I guess over the last decade, I, I see this happen from time to time, that there's somebody that does a cover that is kind of revolutionary for the genre. Yeah. Like it's, it's just distinctive. It's got that it factor. It, you've never really seen anything like it before. And it's a successful book as a result. And then what you see is you see a ton of people come out with covers that look exactly like that. Or they, they kind of they cop the style of mm -hmm. that person. And I think every genre has got 
you know, that book where people are copying, you know, that's one thing. I think if you're literally stealing, um, you know, like you said, font fonts, and I've even seen people steal like, like exact elements from the cover. Like if there's a, like if there's like an illustrated cover and there's a dragon on it, I'll, I've seen them take that same illustration of a dragon which is kind of crazy. Now they're stock photos and any technically anyone can use the same stock photo. Yeah, I've on a, seen on a cover. I've but. seen a, a particular model used multiple times with urban fantasy covers. Uh, yes. like a particular girl and I and yeah. I'm like, "Oh, there's another one of those ones," you know, and it's exactly yeah, the yeah. same model, but this is this is how the Shutterstock and different, you know, deposit faders, this is how they make their money. They they resell the same images with licenses so anybody can use them. Um Correct. so, you know, yeah, sorry, I interrupted, but yeah. No, 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 the, you're, you're absolutely right. Um yeah, there's Shutterstock, which you know you don't have. There's you don't have any control over that. But I've seen people rip off some illustrations too. So that's you know where it's like it was illustrated for that one particular author. Oh wow! And somebody yeah. is you know they ripped elements from the illustration. So I think you have to you know you have to look at it, kind of do the calculus, figure out you know is this are they just copycatting, or are they really infringing on your copyright? And that's where you know you can submit um, requests to the retailers you know, for yeah. them to evaluate it. And if, if they feel that it's serious, then I have seen uh, Amazon and others take some, take some books down as a result, but that's, that's pretty rare. Yeah. And I think if there were um, issues with the contents of the books, you would be more likely to see action taken to do something about that than the covers. Um, unless like, like we've said, they are literally identical. Um but yeah, you look at you look at a crime cover, you know, particularly like British crime or or whatever, and they are all they all look exactly the same. They all have some scenery or setting or British hills on them with this shadowy yeah. figure on the front and red writing or yellow writing or whatever. Like they are all identical, and and so it you know, but but that's how you attract the right reader. So exactly, in some ways, it's actually just good marketing. Yep, fine line between great marketing and. And you could put a positive spin on it, right? And you could say, well, okay, this person's covers are very similar to mine. I'm going to target their readers and do loads of AMS ads targeting their, their, yeah. their books, you know? Then you can put a positive spin on it. Yep. And it's cheeky, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is. It is. So, you know, t sometimes uh, turn, turn limes into lemonade, right? Exactly. <laughs> All right. Next question is, okay, so this is specific to the U.S., um, in the U.S., should I register my copyright to send my advanced reading copies to readers? Oh, so, I've never heard that question before. Yeah, I, I have not heard that either. So uh, just maybe a few things that we want to cover. So in the United States, you know, we're – it's really irritating. We have this registration system for copyright. You're not required to, to register your copyrights with the government, but it is highly encouraged that you do so. So you have to register your copyright in order to sue somebody, that sort of thing. We won't get into the details, but we're unique in, in the wrong way in that regard. So in the question of your ARCs, your, your advanced reader copies, do you need to register your copyright? To me, I don't think you need to register your copyright to send your advanced reader copies to your readers. Um, if you're gonna If you're going to register your copyright, I would do it because you're going to register your copyright. Right. Um, what just because you're sending out ARCs to other people really has nothing to me, has nothing to do with the equation. One, because you've got a copyright notice Two, because they're your readers. You kind of have to trust your readers to not go out and try to infringe your copyrights or steal your work. Uh, you, there is such a thing as coming across as um, um, a bit of a jerk in this regard. With, with copyrights and readers and, and things like that. Um, I, I don't think that you need to do that for ARCs. Sasha, what do you think? It's, it's tricky for me because we don't have the same pressure to register copyright in the UK as people in the US. Mm. So I would never, I would never do that. Um, but that's purely because it's just not the same in the UK as it is uh, in the US. I, I would say that under any law, the, in the moment you finish 
the work, the copyright is yours anyway. So I would say to send them out and just apply for the copyright as soon as you can, because once it's going through process, you would have evidence to say that you have put it through. So even if it's not come back to you yet, you've, you've taken the action to register. So I would just, I wouldn't slow your marketing process down. I would get the books out. Yeah, I mean, it, the thing, the reasons to register copyright, again, are because you, you want to sue someone for infringing on your copyright. You have to be registered. Your work has to be registered for you to do that. That's really the main thing. Some people think, you know, you can register your work to kind of help prove ownership of the work. It's not necessarily the case, um, but it can be expensive, too. I mean, it, you know, you've got to pay, you know chunk of change with every book that you publish. Um, some people don't have the appetite for that. So sometimes that might be a little bit um, more expensive than what people can pay. And so um, I would just encourage people, if you're going to register the copyright to your work anyway, register the copyright to your work. Mm. I don't think you need to register your copyright just because you are sending out an ARC copy like that. To me, it, it, they're not, they're not congruous. That's, yeah. that's all. So if you were already going to do it, then do it. Um, there's, there's, there's no, I think there, if you can afford it, there's no disadvantage to registering your copyright. Um, but otherwise I, I don't think you, you need to, um, but you know, better safe than sorry. Okay. Next question is, uh, does ally offer access to script writers? Mm. So if you're writing a film or uh, wanting to break into the film industry, the answer to that is no, we do not. Unfortunately that I know of, not um, that I know of you know, either. we're, we you know we're focused primarily on uh, authors and, and novelists and, and writers of books. But um, you know, if that ever changes, we'll, we'll definitely let the, let the community know. Yeah. Okay. Next question is my contract with my literary agent is pending to close in 45 days. Can I self-publish my book on pre-order? So it sounds like this person has gotten the rights back to their book, as we have, you know, talked about a lot on on this podcast. And they're almost over the finish line. They want to self-publish the book on pre-order. So I assume that the the publishing date will be after the forty-five days, so that you're you're kind of clear on the contract. What do you think, Sasha? If the pub, if they are not earning royalties. Uh, then whilst they are with, no. So if the agent hasn't sold the book and they are self-publishing the book, they won't. They won't have to uh, give the agent any money because the only time you pay an agent is when the agent has done work for you. So they would have to sell the book um, unless your contract said that your agent would take fifteen percent even of your self-published works. But I have never heard of that. Uh, it in can a happen. No. Yeah. It, it oh can, my goodness it, me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So read your contract. That that's the answer. Yeah, that is the <laughs> read answer. Your, read, read, the your, read your contract. See what you can. See what you can't do. Um, if you know, if, if 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 you've got that that tricky little agency clause in there, then you got to be careful. Um, but if you don't, and it's clear, and all parties are in understanding of what what is going on with the rights reversion, and there is a set date, then I would do it. Yeah, but, I am slightly confused because an agent wouldn't hold rights to a book anyway. A publisher would hold the rights, not so. Yeah, but but the agency clause basically gives the agent the, the a claim to fifteen percent of the royalties. Right, right. right. And so okay. sometimes, sometimes with some unscrupulous agents, you can see that clause persist even you know even even when the agreement's no longer in force. So, and sometimes they can take bites at your next book as well. Is some things that I've seen. So, you know, not it's not to paint agents in a bad light. Uh, that's not what we're trying to do here. Just saying that you need to read your contract and understand what you signed. Yeah, yeah. There are some wonderful agents out there. So, yep. so all right. Next question is, what's the best way to handle character backstories that don't end up in my book? Ooh. So, it's, 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 see, I told you we had some really interesting That's questions. Fun question. Me. I love that yeah, question. Yeah. Oh, let me start. Okay. Yeah, please. So um, this is super fun because uh, if you have enough content that you can turn it into a story, then that is absolutely what I would do. So I, uh, you often see 
uh, indie authors in particular, but sometimes trad authors, writing up side character stories, backstories, uh, villain origin stories. You could have uh, a wound or if it if it was, for example, a, a second chance romance, perhaps you write up the first chance romance part of it. Um, you can use it for a uh, mailing list, uh, what, what's called a reader magnet. So uh, you sign up to my email, um, email mailing list and give me your email address and I will give you this story. Uh, and then you can create what's called an autoresponder series, which is a sequence of emails that you write in advance and that get delivered out over a set period of time. And if you have, say, more than just one of these uh, side character stories or, or character backstories, then you can write them up, have them edited, and you can send them out over a period of weeks to new readers, and that will for sure engage them, make them feel valued and uh, appreciated. And that is a, a really good way to buy uh, your readers into what you do and your work. And of course, if you're clever with it, then at the back of your story, you can also link out to the first book or link out to a different book because it's connected to the characters in that book. So not only are you making your readers feel valued, you're then uh, doing like what I call soft marketing. So rather than going, buy my book, buy my book, you're giving them a story and just saying, hey, if you liked the story, you can read more about these characters in this book or that book. Um, so yeah, it's like a wonderful, wonderful tool to um, give your readers something more. So yeah, like definitely take them out of the story if they're not relevant and they're not advancing the main novel, but don't throw them away. Don't get rid of them. Uh, they're things that readers will always love and appreciate. Yeah. I mean, can you take that and turn it into a novella? Yeah. You know, that's another thing too. I mean, can you repurpose the content, turn it into a, a novella or a short story? In fact, just, just the other day, I got an email in my inbox from an author that I follow who did that very thing. I mean, they basically took some of the backstory and they think they did like a character interview and they put that in an email newsletter. And then there was a link to the series at the bottom of the bottom of the email. So uh, some other things that you could think about doing with it is you, know, you could, um, if you have a Patreon feed, you could offer oh, it to your patrons as, yeah. a, as a bonus. You could also, if you ever do a Kickstarter campaign with this particular series, that could be one of the stretch goals. You know, I mean, there's just use your imagination. There's plenty of things you can do, uh, even if it's just, you know, linking to it on your website somewhere, just upload yeah. it to your website and and share it with your readers and they can download it. You know, I've and seen it, a lot of authors do that, too. If you do like um, book fairs or, or like uh, fairs, reader fairs, um, I don't know quite what they're called, the name. <laughs> I think it's a book fair, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, like, book, book, fair, book fairs, yeah. A book fair, but not like the London book fair. I mean, like the reader end of the book fairs. You could always print them in little chat books and um, give them away for free. You could do a small print run of chat books, which would be very cheap to do. Um, and then yep. give them away and make sure you put like a QR code on the back where they can get more or they can find out a book or, or whatever. So, yeah, use it to your advantage as marketing. Like I always I always think it's uh, you're a very lucky author if you do come out uh, the other end of having finished a book with additional material. I always Always, I never do. I underwrite chronically. So I have to edit my my books longer. So I, there's never any spare words. Uh, so yeah, I'm always very jealous when people do this. I have to intentionally write the additional content. So yeah, I just finished a prequel actually this week. So that's why I love this question so much. It's so timely. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. Yeah, lot, lots of uh, lots of really good ideas. And yeah. um, like I said, sky is the limit. And sometimes the the most interesting and effective way is the the one that's the most out of the box, and that doesn't mean you have to spend a lot of money or any money, for yeah. example. So that's it's cool. All right, next question uh, is from Ishani, and um, I'll just I'll summarize and kind of generalize the question here. Um, can you recommend the best place to find a designer to design a publishing imprint logo? and come up with a style and a brand for a name. So branding, where, where do you go? You know, we, we, we talk all the time about where to go for cover design. Yeah. Where do you go for author branding? Well, designs? funnily enough, 
most designers will actually do this for you. Uh, Mibla are a partner member of Ally, and the, the, and apologies to any other partner, they, they're just the first person that came to my head. Uh, but Mibla have um, a service where they'll do a whole branding package, and I think it's about 150 bucks. Um, and obviously, you can go to uh, any of our partners and have a look on their websites to see. But quite often, uh, a designer who does cover designs will also do logos. Not all of them, of course, you will have to look at their services and what they provide. But many, many, many of them do. Um, and so I would always encourage you to look at the our ratings and, and our um, trusted approved partner services list first and foremost. Um, but other places, Fiverr is a great place to look for logos. You can often get logos very done very, very cheaply. Um, and I would recommend that you, first of all, start Googling and pulling together like a mood board so that because if you go to the designers, you need to be able to say the kind of thing that you're looking for. So, you know, they they won't just pluck random colors out of the air. They'll want to know, you know, oh, I want a blue type feel to my, and then they'll start to be able to pull stuff together. And so one of the quickest ways to do that is to do a bit of research, maybe try pin, Pinterest is a great place to look for um, visual ideas and inspiration. Um, and then once you've started to collect some images that kind of give the look and feel of what you're after, that's when you can then go to a designer. But yeah, I would say, look at Ally's uh, partner list, first and you can do that by logging into the alliance of independent authors dot org um log into the dashboard and go to appro uh, approved services and then uh, yeah you can go down the rabbit hole and you'll be able to find a whole bunch of designers and check them first and then failing that i would say try fiber yeah I, okay so I, i'm gonna disagree a little bit Ooh, um, okay. I, I, li I like most of what you said um uh, mibble art i second strongly second i've used them for my cover designs um they're fantastic and again they, they 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 came to my mind as well when this question came out so if you can find an ally partner member to help you do this you're in the clear no, no problem i like fiverr a lot i do a lot of work on fiverr i don't necessarily know that i would do a logo design on fiverr um, and if i were to do a logo design on fiverr here is what i would do there are some issues with, and this is not Fiverr's fault, but there are some issues with Fiverr with people who um, design logos that, that are not actually theirs. You know, the, oh. the either st stolen logos or copyright infringement. A, a lot of logos kind of have the same, this, the same like kind of cheap vector feel to them. I, I, I don't know how else to describe it, but, you know, just go on Fiverr and look at some logos. You'll know what I'm talking about. Um, they just, they, they look real cheap. They don't look, good at all. Um, that's the kind of stuff you really want to be careful of. I've heard some situations where people have gotten logos designed. Turns out um, the designer didn't actually design that logo. It was stolen or it was infringed or significantly copped off of something else. So yeah, just be really careful about that. If I were going to do logo work, I would actually go to a site like Upwork and then I would screen the applicants um, and do, a, do some more due diligence to really make sure that what they say they're doing is actually their, their work. Um, that's just me. I'm not saying that Fiverr is a bad place to get a design. You can get a design there cheaply, but you, are, you just have to be really careful and do some due diligence to make sure that this designer is legit um, mm -hmm. and that they're designing because you, you you can get burned, you know. I mean, we talked about copyright infringement earlier, right? If you infringe on someone's copyright, or even worse, their trademark, you know, you can get sued for a substantial amount of money. So, I'm not trying to scare people, but again, just due diligence, due diligence. Just make sure that whoever you go with is highly rated. They are they have a track record of of creating logos that are not like anyone else's. And then you know, do a reverse image search when you do get a logo, just to see if anything else very similar pops up. It might be a wise idea as well. So um, I don't know. What do you think? I, I, it, it's... Yeah, yeah, I think that's a, that's a great idea about the reverse image. Um, I didn't know any of the issues with Fiverr, but I think that probably, 
I think the ethos of checking and doing due diligence should be there regardless of whether it's a, a, an approved partner or not. Um, I think whenever we take a service from somebody, we should always check. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I agree. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree. I haven't ever used Upwork. Um, I've only used Fiverr once, but yeah, that's what I like. And, and the reason I like Upwork a little bit better for something like that is that you can screen your applicants. So mm-hmm. you can you can force them to a- answer questions, yeah. you know, so, you know, you can say, you know, talk, talk to me about other projects you've done that are similar to this in the past. Yeah, right. I mean, the, the the only other thing that I can think of, um, if you have an artist that you particularly like, you could always query an artist as well. So um, like mm-hmm. my sister does graphic design. And I was just like, hey, do you want to do a logo for me? Like, and it's not something that she's always done before. But, you know, sometimes you can you can have an artist or a particular style or, or you know, form of art that you particularly like. And you could actually work that in as well. And uh, Instagram's a great place to find artists. So, right. And then, you know, and there's sites like 99 designs. Yeah. Um, I mean, you have tons of options available at your disposal. And, and again, I'm not trying to cast aspersions on Fiverr. The, 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 the question, the questioner did mention Fiverr um, as well. Um, it's a terrific marketplace. They do a really good job of trying to, to crack down on some of that behavior. But as with all places, as Sasha said, we just want people to really be thinking about due diligence. Yeah. You know, because you want a cover or not a cover, but you want a, a logo and branding that is going to be unique and doesn't look like anyone, yes. everybody else's. Right. And, yes. and you also want that to be effective and you want it to be original and unique. And so um, by doing that, oh, another thing you want to think about is y- you need to have a contract with the designer to make sure that you own the copyright. Oh, that's a great point. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't design, don't get a logo designed and then don't settle that. Because as we've talked about before on the show, you know, if you, if you don't say that you own the copyright, then the designer owns the copyright. Now, um, fun fact that a lot of people probably don't know is sites like Fiverr and Upwork. If you read the terms of service, it actually says that the uh, copyright transfers to the buyer. So that, that is one good reason to use Fiverr is that any work you do, you get done with Fiverr. Um, creative, creatively, whether it be a cover or branding, um, my understanding in the terms of service is that it transfers to the buyer. So that's yeah, something that's that great. you don't necessarily have to worry about. Yeah. So, but whatever you use, make sure you account for that in your calculus somewhere because you don't you don't want to create branding somewhere and then all of a sudden some you know the designers say you know what I don't like your politics or I don't like that interview you gave with Sasha Black. <laughs> I'm taking my copyright back. I'm revoking my license. You know, yeah. that'd be pretty, pretty detrimental to your author business. So yeah. make sure you, make sure you, you, you tie, tie the, cross those, cross those T's and dot those I's. Or as I like to say, cross the, cross those I's and dot those T's. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Next question is, okay, so this is a bit of a long one, but I'll paraphrase it as best I can. Sasha, I know you have a, a, an answer for this one. Please provide, explain the lawyer services provided to members and give their contact information. Um, well, we can't do that, but also provide some details on how to how to sign up for Ally Selective Rights Licensing Services. Okay, so it's, it's not quite, it doesn't work quite how um, this person's asking. If you have a contractual query and you have a contract that needs reading or you need help with a contract, you can contact the rights desk um, and you can do that basically by going through exactly the same normal channel uh, that we always do. Uh, Michael, what is the, where's the contact form? Oh, uh, okay. Um, yeah. I knew you were going to ask me that. Yeah. Why don't, you, why don't you keep talking and I'll, I'll, I'll talking. That's I, I'm, a great I'm pretty, idea. I'm pretty, I'm pretty sure it's uh, allianceindependentauthors.org slash contact. But yes, uh, okay. So use I'll the normal that. contact form and then you can tell them the issue, say that you want to speak to the rights desk and you will get forwarded to the correct person who will be able to provide some help and assistance on your contractual issue. Now, the program that you're talking about, the selective rights licensing uh program that was a uh, sort of task and finish group so it was a complete program that ran for six months only it was a one-off and it was in the lead up to London Book Fair I want to say it was before the pandemic so it was a good few years ago now um, yeah. 
So that's complete and the learning is complete from that. We're not running it again, um, but if you would like to get the learning from that, then you can. There are plenty of um, articles on the blog site, which is selfpublishingadvice.org. Um, and if you type in like rights, uh, selective rights licensing or rights licensing, then you will find um, a, a raft of different articles talking about rights, talking about selling rights uh, and talking about that program. And you can watch all of the videos. They're still up there um, for that. So, yeah. Excellent. All right. Next question is, is there a standard disclaimer that can be used in the copyright page of nonfiction books to state that they are general advice only? I've been looking at examples and they are all so different. Um, this book that I'm writing is general in nature and the format uses coaching questions and considerations in order to help people make decisions. There's no medical or financial or legal advice. What do you think, Sasha? So I don't think there are any standard um, copyright notices. There are There's key phrasing that is pretty similar, I would say, across a lot of books. But there is no, um, as well, and you are a better person to answer this, but to my knowledge, there's no legal clause or terminology that is a standard that would be expected right. to go in there. So what I tend to do is I tend to look in half a dozen, a dozen books and, you know, combine them into what I think is the best sounding copyright page. Um, and we have also published an article recently, in fact, on copyright pages. And I believe we actually used one of your books in, in that. So I, I don't know, I could be oh, wrong. Um, cool. <laughs> but yeah, so we, I can, we can put that link in the show notes uh, because, yeah, there are a multitude of different ways you can uh, slice this cake. But basically, there is no legal standard. And so you can write whatever you want to cover off, essentially, I would say. Yeah, no, I, I, that's, that's great. I, that's exactly kind of how I thought of it too, is, you know, you look at a bunch of title or look at a bunch of books, mash them together, pick and choose, and then just use that consistently in all of your books. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, for nonfiction, you know, there, there is an, there, there is certainly an increased concern because, you know, you're giving people advice and, you know, what if they follow the advice to their detriment and, you know, so on and so forth. And I think generally speaking, people, people understand that, you know, the advice in a book is not financial or legal advice, um, you know, unless you're crossing some sort of ethical line, right? So like, you know, in the books that I write, I, I'm always very careful to explain that nothing I share is legal advice, right? Yeah, well, you can um, write that statement as well. Up front, yeah, you can like write in that the in the book. Yeah. Yeah, you can write it in the intro and then, you know, you can reiterate it throughout the book as well. That yeah. might also give you some, some additional insurance, so to speak. But, uh, you know, there's, there's no right or wrong way to do it. I think even if you, even if you consulted with attorneys, I think, you know, you consult with 10 different attorneys. I think you'd get 10 different answers yeah. <laughs> about what, what, what should be on your copyright page. So, you know, I, I would follow Sasha's advice, do what feels right. And, uh, you know, re, you know, mention it in your book as well in the text of the book, if there's a particular section that uh, maybe you have some concerns about, and I think you'll be okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next question is, and um, let us know if we under, if we interpreted this question properly. This is from uh, member Trevor. What are the repercussions of placing a paperback with Kindle on Amazon and a hardcover with Lulu? So to paraphrase, I want to publish my paperback on Amazon, KDP print. And I want to publish my hardcover with Lulu. I don't know why you, you would want to do that, but maybe there's maybe there's something with the hardcover that's more attractive with Lulu, right? Um, yeah. I, I guess I would say there's repercussions. I mean, other than you know the royalty structures and the fact that you know you've got to use two different dashboards, you know, to me would be uh, you know, the first thing I probably would think about, but you know, if there, if there is a, a, a reason that you want to use Lulu as opposed to KDP print for, for hardcovers, you know, I, I think that's your decision. Uh, just be prepared to under, just understand, you know, what the pricing structure is. Um, 
you know, understand the the nuances of both dashboards, um, that sort of thing. But I, I don't, you know, off the top of my head, I don't necessarily think there's a negative repercussion. What do you no. think, Sasha? No, I don't think so. As long as you understand that um, Amazon always prioritizes Amazon published books. So, um, for example, I publish my hardbacks with Ingram Spark because I like the fancy jackets that go with them. And yeah. uh, so quite often it takes an awful lot longer for the information to populate. It takes longer for the cover to come over and go onto the sales page. Although uh, once they do come over, they all uh, sync up quite quickly. Uh, but just, yeah, that that's probably one of the downsides uh, if you are publishing uh, one with the other. But in terms of like I'm not I, w I wasn't sure if this question was about KU and exclusivity, um, I, you know, because sometimes that gets confused. But exclusivity with KU is only for your ebook. So you can right. actually publish your paperback with whoever you like. Um, and the other thing to say is make sure, well, if you can, that you've well, you will have to, I think, but you will need an ISBN, one for the hardback and a different one for the paperback. Um so that's another thing just to think about. We've got an ISBN guide as well. Um, if you remember, you can download that. So, um, yeah, there are sometimes issues with Amazon KDP Print and Ingram Spark with paperbacks and where you load it first. But broadly speaking, I can't see any issue with doing this. Yeah. Yep. Maybe so, the okay. other thing, sorry, one other thing is okay. to print a copy is to print a proof copy of each so you can see the quality and then make the decision that way. Yeah. Quality is another, another aspect that, you know, we didn't cover. So yeah, look at the quality, compare, compare the quality, you know, between the two services and figure out which one readers would like the most. Although I would, I would probably hazard a guess that it's going to be pretty similar between the two. Mm. So, I mean, Lulu has been around a long time. Um, KDP print has been around a long time. So yeah, I mean, just look at all the look at all of the elements and just kind of figure out what you want to do. Okay, uh, next question is one that we get from time to time. It's uh, kind of an unfortunate question if it happens, but uh, the question is, what do I do if Amazon terminates my account? So this happens from time to time, and you know that there are various reasons that Amazon sometimes does this. Sometimes it. You know, there's a human on the other end that uh, determines that uh, your account needs to be canceled. More often than not, from what I can tell, it's usually an algorithm. So sometimes uh, your book could get caught up in a sweep of, um, you know, people that might be doing something that's unscrupulous and, you know, your book looks like it could be. And so the algorithm flags you as a result. It, it's just, it's a terrible situation to be in. I've known authors personally that have been in this situation. Um, and so the advice that I would give is if, if Amazon terminates your account, I think the first thing you need to figure out is why they terminated your account. Um, were you following all the terms of service that you should have been, which 99% of people are? Um, so if the answer to that is yes, if you were following the terms of service, you know, I, I, you know, I would write them and just try to try to try to get some sort of explanation and understand that sometimes you are going to feel like you're you're doing karate against a brick wall. I mean, that's the best way to yeah. kind of describe it. You're going to get form letter responses. You, eventually, maybe, you know, you, you, you may not get a response at all. So the thing to do is to be persistent and to continue doing it and lay out the facts of, of your case of why you think that uh, your account should be restored. Um, and, and yeah, if, if you really are struggling with, uh, with this and, and, you know, you feel like you, you're in the right and you, you haven't um, done anything that, that has violated their services and you're an ally member, please write us in confidence. Oh, and Sasha, that link was correct. It is allianceindependentauthors.org slash contact. Right. Give us your member number. Uh, tell us the details of, of what's going on. And um, Ally does have a relationship with KDP where we can try to, to advocate on your behalf. Certainly no promises, but um, you know, if, if you get to the end of the road and you, and you, you feel like you're not getting any other progress, that, that is an avenue that you can follow as well, which is another great reason to be a member if you're not a member. But mm -hmm. first, mo first thing, most important, just make sure you, if you haven't done it, read the KDP terms of service. 
you know, it's nobody likes to do it, but just read the terms of service, make sure you understand it and then abide by it by the letter. And if you do that, you shouldn't have any problems where people get in trouble sometimes is where there's, there's a guideline that's kind of a gray area, you know? And so a lot of people sometimes take advantage of it. And then Amazon wakes up one day, decides, nope, we're not going to allow that, you know, and then you get caught up in it. So just read the terms of service, abide by the terms of service. Even if, you know, it, it, it's kind of like you, your parents said, you know, when you were a kid, if Timmy and, and Jamie jumped off a bridge, would you jump off a bridge too? <laughs> No, you wouldn't. So just, this is one area where you want to follow the rules. Yeah. All right. So it's follow the rules. And if you do that, then, you know, hopefully sometimes accounts can get caught up and, you know, a bust. I don't know what, what, another way to say it, but sometimes your account could be wrongfully term. Your account could be wrongfully terminated for reasons that are not your own. And so um, if that happens, just follow the steps that we talked about and, and, you know, pretty optimistic that, that you'll get a good result, but it, it is, it is frustrating. It is, it is scary. And, um, you know, there's a lot of emotions that can go with something like that. So just be careful and, and just be persistent if it does happen to you. Okay. The next question is, uh, let's see. Okay. Next question is from Graham. I started placing my books through Ingram this year. Um, how do I increase my sales in this area? So paperback sales distribution through Ingram, which is great, Graham. Good on you for doing that. That's mm -hmm. fantastic. You know, getting your books distributed through Ingram Spark. So now, you know, anybody anywhere in, anywhere in the world can order your books if they want to. So yeah. Sasha, Sasha, what are your tips for improving <laughs> well, your paperback sales? It feels like the age old question, really, because, yeah. you know, how do you how do you make any book sell? Well, the same way you make any book sell. Um, I think I think the thing to understand, first of all, is are you in a genre where paperbacks reign supreme? Because as indie authors, typically, not always, but very, very often, we get the majority of our income from ebooks because the proportion of income per book sold is often radically more than uh, paperbacks. So what I would say is one assess, are you in a genre that sells a lot of paperbacks? So do you write middle grade fiction, for example? Do you write young adult fiction? Um, if you don't write those or perhaps you write uh, so non-fiction for example often people buy non-fiction in paperback because they're learning they scribble notes in so I find that um, up to 35 percent of my non-fiction sales are paperbacks and it's about five percent of my fiction <laughs> so like it's a big big difference um so that's the first thing. Just to, just work out whether or not your time spent trying to sell paperback specifically is going to be worthwhile for the amount of time it takes in order for the effort to um, to get them to sell. But not worded that very correctly, but hopefully you understand what I mean. Um, and then doing all of the things that we all do normally, you will naturally sell some paperbacks anyway. Um, if you want to sell paperbacks specifically, you could go through depending on what genre you write in. Um, if you wrote nonfiction, you could try and get um, whole, like a big sale, like in um, corporate environments, bulk sales, you could if you were if you write for children, then try and do school visits, uh, where you get uh, a book uh, like a certain number of book sales uh, for the children in the school where you do signings, you could attend fairs, uh, things like this. And then if you would like a less time intensive option, you could run AMS ads, which is the Amazon advertising uh, directly to paperbacks specifically if you want to increase your paperback sales. So that's one thing that you could do uh, as well. And then in terms of just increasing them generally, I would just try and increase your sales generally, run adverts, run sales, run promos, collaborate with other authors, see if they will promote in their newsletters. Will you promote in your newsletter? Um, you know, you could always try and do a local event with with a local bookstore. But bear in mind, you're, only, you're going to be hand selling a couple of copies. This is not going to be uh, making stacks and stacks of money uh, doing that. So. Yeah, I mean, it's a long winded response, but basically any actions that you take to increase your book sales in general will have a, a, an impact on 
paperback sales but just do the work up front and establish whether or not you are in a genre that is going to sell a lot of paperbacks otherwise spend your time marketing the ebooks or just marketing yourself in general agree agree and um you know the first step in improving your sales is to make them available so you know assuming you have your own isbns right which is really important they're available through ingram so it, it, it can serve as a multiplier effect. That's what Sasha said. So the more marketing you do, the more people will know that you have paperbacks. I mean, make sure that uh, readers know when they see your books on your book pages that you have paperbacks. So if you're on your author website and you've got a, a page dedicated to each book, let them know that it's available in paperback. I mean, it, it's, it, it seems like an obvious thing, but sometimes people want to know that or they need to know that. So that's one thing you could do. Um, you mentioned paid advertising, Sasha, which I think is great. You know, Facebook is another example where you can, you can get really granular. You can target paperback readers specifically. So yeah, lots of options, um, you know, and don't, don't discount your local options as well. I mean, I, one of the things that I've started doing is um, getting author copies of my books and taking them to any little free library I can find. So, you know, they've got the little free libraries where people can put them in their front yard and, you know, you can take a book or leave a book. I've done that. I've just, I, on a Saturday afternoon, just drive around to as many places, many of those places as I can find. Um, when you travel, take some, take, take some paperbacks with you. Hotels often have uh, little reading libraries. I was just in Chicago and um, I was wandering around the hotel and like in one of the little nooks and crannies of the, the hotel, they had like this giant bookcase. And it was like hardcover city of pretty much every, every thriller and mystery author you can imagine. And I was like, oh, man, I need to get some science fiction and fantasy on there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so if, if, if I if I was smart, you know, if I go back to Chicago and stay in that hotel, I'm going to bring some hardcovers of my fantasy with me. Those, you know, and I'm going to put it on that cover or put those, it on that little area. Those bookcases are like gold. They are amazing. Yeah. I remember being on holiday in Turkey once and I was randomly reading a True Blood series by Charlene Harris. And I think I was on like book three, like no word of a lie. I was in this hotel. I went to the bookcase because I'd finished and I, I was like, oh no, what am I? I've read all the books I brought. The whole rest of the series, starting from book four, was there. I could not wow. believe my luck. It was incredible. So I just binge read the whole rest. Of it. And then I left them there for somebody else to have. But like, yeah. oh, it was fantastic. Like these, those people appreciate those bookcases. Do it. Do it. It's a fantastic oh, absolutely, idea. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, don't don't discount that. I mean, I forget how many times a paperback changes hands before, you know, before it gets destroyed. I mean, lot. it's like. It's like six or seven times, yeah. might be more than that. So, you know, used books is a, a big opportunity as well. So, you know, availability, access, all the stuff Sasha talked about with advertising, doing other things that are not necessarily related to paperbacks, but will improve your paperback sales. And just thinking outside the box, I think you can help, help improve your sales. Okay. Uh, two more questions. All right. So the, uh, the next question is from... Lori, uh, on my first attempt to publish with Ingram Spark, they say that my promo code has expired, but I just joined last month. How do I fix this problem? Uh, it's not a problem with you. It's that uh, the code changes monthly. So you have to go in and recheck every single time you publish a book. Um, I have been publishing paperbacks and hardbacks over the last two months. And so I had to go and change my code because we slipped from December to January. So yeah, it's not you. The codes, the codes still work. They just change monthly. So go back and check again. Yeah. And the way you do that is to go to allianceindependentauthors.org, log into your dashboard, Go to the discounts and deals section and then look up Ingram and then you'll see the new code there. So try that and um, you should see some success. Okay, next question and last question, Sasha. Where can I find a website designer? Well, we've mentioned it a couple of times uh, today, but you can go to our approved partner list. That is always the first place I recommend that you start for any uh, service hunting uh, situation. So yeah, log into the Alliance of Independent Authors, go to approved 
services or proof partners I can't quite remember the exact wording um and then yeah have a look in type in what you're after and you can we have a raft of uh, providers in there and you you will be guaranteed to find something that will that will work for you so that's where I would go personally yeah I, I would start there as well and you know consider do you need a website designer or do you need a website theme so many people's just starting off. I actually argue you don't need a website designer. I think a website designer, getting hiring a designer for your website is almost too much firepower mm-hmm. because it, it's like it's like shooting at a target that you don't know where the target is. And, and let me explain what I mean by that. So so when I started as an author in 2014, if I had hired a website designer, I would have made a colossal mistake. I would have wasted money. Um, it just would have wouldn't have wouldn't probably wouldn't have worked because I wouldn't have known what would have been effective. Right. Like I I just wouldn't have known what should be on my website. Um, You know, and I don't necessarily know that I would have been able to articulate to a designer what my needs were at that point. And it's not a knock on any designers, Um, but probably two, three years, four years in, I got a lot more data about who was visiting my website, what was important to them, the types of pages that they wanted to see and the types of things that they were clicking on. And so um, hiring a designer later down the road would have been a better option. It would have been a more effective use of my money. So if you're just starting off, I I recommend just looking into a a good WordPress theme. You know, those are already pre-designed for you. You don't have to worry about it. You're not going to spend a whole lot of money on them. And then when you're ready for a designer later, you can get one. Try, try um, Studio Press if you use WordPress because yeah. I've used Studio Press and they are fantastic. They have some great and they're really affordable as well. And it they have very, very comprehensive in, installation instructions. And um, I'm not very good at following instructions. So <laughs> honestly, if, if I can do it, anybody can do it. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Studio Press is great. That's actually one of the ones I started with. I think I started with a Studio Press site um elegant themes divi is another one that is really easy to use you know so there's lots of kind of done for you designs now with that you're you you get convenience but you know you can't really customize it a whole lot there are some designers that do work with studio press and, and elegant themes though where you can hire them down the road and they can just design something on top of what you already have so there's lots of options but when i first started off as an author i didn't know what those options were You know, like I I thought, you know, you actually had to have a a programmer design your website from the ground up and it's just not like that anymore. So I recommend people start with a theme. Once you've started to publish a few books and you understand the nature of um, your readers and, and, you know, what people are resonating with on your site, then shell out a designer. It'll, it'll, it'll just make your money go a lot further. Mm -hmm. That's, that's Michael Laron's opinion. So, um, so, Okay. Well, Sasha, another month. Another we made month. it. month. We did it. Yeah. Thank you all for the amazing questions. And don't forget, if you're an Ally member, you can ask your questions at uh, allianceindependentauthors.org. Uh, just log in and there is a link on uh, the dashboard where you can submit your question. And, you know, you just might see it answered live here on the show. All right. So with that, Sasha, you are going to be on holiday next month. So Orna Um, will be with me next month. Enjoy. Don't miss me too much. (laughs) (laughs) I don't, you know, I don't, I don't think we're going to be able to do this. I know. I I think we might just have to cancel. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Just kidding. Orna will be here. So uh, it'll be me and Orna again next month. All right. And I think it's on Valentine's day. So we may have to do a, a special theme like, um, what to get your spouse if you're an author for Valentine's Day. Yeah. Like, uh, <laughs> be a, a spouse for putting up with all the sitting in the room alone and making stuff up, right? So and all the time if you have the keyboard. It, exactly. So so this is just a PSA. It's gonna come up on you quick. Make sure uh, you get that get, get those Valentines, folks. Well, all right. Well, we'll go ahead and end it. Thank you again for listening to the Self-Publishing Advice and Inspirations podcast, member Q&A podcast. We will talk to you next month and happy writing, everyone. Bye.